Oh Lord, the songs we have just sung anchor our hearts in the truths of the past, the things you have accomplished, and they tether us to the future. They knit our hearts together in anticipation of of the realities that will be ours when faith becomes sight and we are in your presence. Lord, we thank you for the work of Christ that secures for us an eternity in your presence. Our hearts feel the tensions of anticipating such things, singing beyond our abilities to live, looking forward to that perfection which is promised. We ask tonight that you would help us, that you would use your word Allow your word to be the expression of our own hearts and pray that we would be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We are in the book of Psalms, making our way through the first 50 for now, one at a time. And tonight we find ourselves in Psalm 9. I invite you to turn there. Godliness is not giddiness. Sometimes we equate a shallow happiness with things going well, being blessed, being in God's favor. But as we will see this evening, the psalmist sings, pens songs for us that express a godly perspective under distress. You see, we live in this life, and at times we have heavy hearts. There are distressing realities. To set the tone just a little bit, I, I want to take some words from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Just so that we're not under the impression that godly people are never depressed, never distressed, never sorrowful, never heavy-hearted. Here we have the words of Paul. He says, God, 2 Corinthians 1, 4, comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. In verse 8, he says, we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of our affliction. It came to us in Asia. We were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even to live. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not have confidence in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Little window into the heart of a godly man who knew what it was to be depressed, to be on the very precipice of the gates of death, longing for help from God. The psalmist takes us there. If you've got Psalm 9 open, let's read it together. Follow along with me as we hear the words of David, who similarly was distressed of soul. He writes, for the choir director, Almuth Laban, a Psalm of David. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will recount all your wondrous deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you, for you have maintained my justice and my cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins, and you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. But Yahweh abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. And he will judge the world in righteousness. He will render justice for the peoples with equity. Yahweh also will be a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of distress. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to Yahweh who abides in Zion. Declare among the peoples his acts. For he who requires blood remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Yahweh. See my affliction from those who hate me. You lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. 
Yahweh has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. Higayon Selah. The wicked will return to Sheol, even all the nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, O Yahweh, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let the nations know they are but men. This is a song in the songbook of Israel, written by a songwriter who is distressed. In the latter half of that song, you hear something of the thematic context. At the top, we get the ascription. Remember, the ascription is part of the psalm for the choir director. Again, this is to be sung. Just as Chris was introducing our songs for this evening, these are not on-ramps to preaching. They are themselves expressions of doctrine intended for the gathering of God's people to have our hearts soar to eternal truths. For the choir director means that this song was intended for the people of Israel to sing, sing truth to one another. And even though the singers who would follow David would not have shared his exact experiences, they would have their own. They would feel their own distresses. They would feel the oppression under injustices themselves. And they would be taught by this song to turn their hearts toward God. In the ascription, you have Almuth Laban. Uh, This is the only place you have this Hebrew phrase in the Old Testament. And so it's somewhat unknown. Uh, There are two possible meanings. To the tune of death of a son is one possible meaning. The other possible meaning is to be sung by a soprano. (laughs) Those Those are pretty different meanings. I don't know which one it's supposed to be. We do learn that this is a psalm of David. If you're looking at the Legacy Standard Bible, uh, you may notice some funny words in an alternate text color in front of some of the verses. The the first one there is Aleph. That is the first Hebrew letter of the alphabet. And as you make your way through, at least in the Legacy Standard Bible, you will see various letters of the Hebrew alphabet, not only the Hebrew letter printed there, but also it's spelled out in English. It simply means that this is something of an acrostic poem. It is working its way through the alphabet. And it's sort of a way to remember, oh yeah, the first stanza A's, it's going to help me memorize it. It it also has an artistic flair to it as it it works through the alphabet. It it doesn't cover every letter, but it does cover the letters of the Hebrew alphabet successively. And Psalm 9 gets us through about half of the Hebrew alphabet. Psalm 10 picks up where Psalm 9 leaves off and gets us through the back half of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, which is why many believe these were really two songs in one. Uh, this is a sort of a part one and part two. And, and we'll look, Lord willing, at Psalm 10 next week. But Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 cover the same themes and have a slightly different flavor. Psalm 9 is somewhat more confident. It begins with praise and thanksgiving and confident eschatology. Psalm 10 is a little bit more perplexed. Oh God, why have you abandoned me? And we don't have any historic, specific historic instruction about when this took place, what was the setting, but the thematic background becomes evident. This psalm depicts the tension of living in a world where the wicked get what they want, that people live unjustly and they oppress the needy and the vulnerable. David himself is is being mistreated by those around him and he's crying out for help. And what's so helpful for us about the Psalms is they give voice to the perplexity of life, the tensions of life, praise and bewilderment, confidence and pleading with God. And we'll see that in both of these Psalms back to back. Tonight in Psalm 9, we will learn in six stanzas to put confidence in a just God while suffering under the injustices of man. That is the main idea of Psalm 9, confidence in a just God while suffering under the injustices of man. 
We'll organize this in sort of six stanzas. If you want to think about the the verses in a song, uh, six of these. And the first one we have here this evening is render praises to God. We're, We're going to learn from the first two verses that when we are feeling the oppression of injustice, when we are feeling the mistreatment of unjust men, we are to take confidence in a just God. And that begins in this psalm with praise. Look down at verse 1. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will recount all your wondrous deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And David starts with gratitude. You see that in verse 1. I will give thanks to Yahweh with all my heart. I will cast my thanksgiving upon him, he says. And and David does this full-hearted with everything that he has. I don't know if that's typically your first response when you're feeling mistreated. I need to go to the Lord and give thanks. But this actually is a wonderful exercise to cast thanks upon the Lord as as a starting point. It's not where all the Psalms start, but it is where Psalm 9 starts with gratitude. And, And truly a wonderful exercise under duress for a distressed soul is to make a catalog of the things for which you can be thankful to God. If you haven't done that exercise, I would commend it to you, especially on a difficult day, on a hard day, when you're feeling mistreated, when you are discouraged, when you're under duress. Consciously express gratitude to God. Just start making a list of all that he has done for you. David moves on in the second half of verse 1 to remembrance. He says, I will recount all your wondrous deeds. Here the gratitude is not general, but it is specific to the things that God has done. David has a record of God's dealings with him. David can recount the things that God has done. That is a different perspective than just sort of floating through life. He says literally, I will recount all your surpassings. All those things that just surpass Extravagant graces, David recounts. It's good to make a list of these remembrances, to write a song about these remembrances. This is good medicine for the soul. David moves in verse 2 to gladness. I will be glad and I will exult in you. You see, God would have his people be glad. It is the foundational nature of the word blessed, happiness. That's not a a giddiness that ignores circumstances, but it is a joy, a gladness in God. And here it is a gladness in God in the midst of difficulty. The thoughts of God's kindnesses to us are an oasis when we are oppressed by wrongdoing. Maurice Roberts said, the thought of God is a panacea to the Christian heart. That is a truth. If we have our eyes fixed on our difficulties... We will end up in a mire. But to lift our gaze and to think of the goodness and the greatness of God, we can find gladness in him. And then in the second half of verse 2, this gladness goes public in singing. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. He says, I will sing praises to your name. That is shorthand for the sum total of God's attributes expressed in his being. And then he lists one of the names of God, O Most High. That's not an adjective as much as it is a descriptive name of God. That is the way it appears throughout the Old Testament. It's a fitting name for God. He is bigger than everything. He is certainly bigger than our troubles. That is where David's heart goes. And then that is where his voice goes, even in leading the congregation to worship God. Chris said it in our introduction this evening. That when we gather and we sing to one another, it produces a contagion of worship, a contagion of praise. We are reminding one another about truths about God. Again, this is an interesting place to start when you're feeling the weight of injustice. Rejoicing, gladness, singing, gratitude, praise. It's a good place to start. Good place to start for us as believers in Jesus Christ is always the gospel. When you ask the question, what do I deserve and what am I getting instead? That should always be a remedy to a distressed soul. 
No matter how much you are being pressed in by injustices or mistreatments, you are not getting what you deserve. You are receiving grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy from a loving God who has rescued you from eternal wrath, from his own anger, from his own justice, from his own beauty and holiness and goodness. In that presence, you could not stand unless you yourself were declared to be just and right and holy and good. That is a declaration only of grace, not of merit, acquired only by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You believe that Jesus paid for your sins on his death at the cross, and then you have forgiveness of sins. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. And so to think about oppressions and difficulty and trials and distress, I deserve all of that. And much more, infinitely more. It's a good place for a Christian to start. Right where the good news is. Where we can give thanks to Yahweh. We can recount his wondrous deeds. We can be glad and exult. And we can sing praise. That's not the end of the psalm. That is the starting place. And a good starting place it is. We move to a second What do we learn from this song? As we sit under the injustices of men and and we are to contemplate a just God, we ought to recall the destiny of the unjust. We see this in verses 3 through 6. David teaches us to sing, When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my justice and my cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end and in perpetual ruins. And you have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them has perished. Now the scholars who have written about this psalm are all over the place on the timing of these verbs. Uh, These have a a specific verb form in Hebrew that can be taken a number of ways depending on the time frame that's being described. And and some would say that the time frame here is a looking back. David can look back at, at previous circumstances where enemies rose up against him or against the people of God and God dealt with those enemies. God turned them back. And they stumbled and they perished. Three times the word perished is used in this section. God maintained my justice and my cause. You sat on your throne judging righteously. You rebuked the nations. You made the wicked perish. You blotted out their name forever and ever. There's no trace left of those who stood against God and against his people because God brought them to an end. Verse 6, the enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins. All you have is the archaeological relics of these nations, of these people, of these enemies that rose up against God and his people. And it says the very memory of them has perished. There, There aren't even history books to record some of these things. That is a way to take this section as looking back. Another way to take this section is sort of an ongoing reality. When enemies turn back, they stumble and perish. God maintains our cause. He sits on the throne. He rebukes nations. He makes the wicked perish. He blots out their name. Sort of an ongoing reality of what God does with the wicked, the unjust. And then there is, of course, the the way to take this as the future reality. God will do these things. And, and to, to speak of these verbs as sort of a, a past tense reality pointing to a future truth. It's as good as done in the mind of God. I don't know that I could settle the debate about the time frame that's uttered here. But I would say that looking back at God's past dealings is a pre-installment of what God will absolutely do in final form in the end. When he brings all injustice to heal. When he rights every wrong. When he establishes that which is just and right forever. 
And in the meantime, we can see that God does these kinds of things. But the reason there is a Psalm 9 in our Bible is because it's not finished yet. There is a tension. And I think it's true that we can look back and see God has dealt with the enemies of his people. And and there are entire civilizations in heaps of ruins. Consider the Assyrian Empire. I know that's after David's time, but from our perspective, it's past tense. They assaulted God's people. Uh, They took parts of the nation into exile. And they were so obliterated from the face of the earth that archaeologists believe they never had existed. Uh, The the trend in the late 1800s with the Assyrian Empire was, well, that's just a, a mythological creation of Israel you can't trust the Bible as a historical document. The, the Assyrians don't exist. How did, how did the scientists, the archaeologists, the historians know the Assyrians didn't exist? Well, they couldn't find them. They had been so obliterated by God that, that there was nothing to find until they did find them. Archaeologists, of course, dug up Nineveh, the capital city, and Ashur, the other major city of the Assyrian Empire. And you can actually go and see their relics and their artifacts in the British Museum today. But the point is, they are relics and artifacts of a civilization long gone. God has done this kind of thing, has erased the memory. There are many more that we could name, but we can't name because we don't know who they are because their memory has perished. We could point to some that God has wiped out. We know that God is just, but the tension of this psalm is the contemplation of injustices in our present day. So there's a twofold comfort here for us. A look back and realize that God has taken care of injustices in the, fact, in the past. And he's done so in such a, such a way that has blotted out their name forever and the very memory of them has perished, verses 5 and 6. But again, that, that walks us forward to when these things will be finally done. And and that is our comfort. In the present, we we see verse 4 that God has sat on a throne judging righteously. What is the nature of God's judgment? He is a just judge. He does what is right. He, He is not fickle. He is not capricious. And when God deals with wickedness, His dealings are thorough and final and just and terrifying. Do you understand that God has the resources to deal with inequities and iniquities far beyond our ability to understand? In in our puny minds, we are disproportioned and, and we go out to set things right. We always get it wrong. God sits on a throne of justice and he judges righteously. That is a matter of comfort for David and a comfort for us as we look over his shoulder in this song. The next stanza, number three, gives us another thing to learn as we sit under injustices, the injustices of man looking towards a just God. We must rehearse the character of God if we follow the template of this psalm. Rehearse the character of God. In verses 7 through 10, we are just going to see a a train of God's attributes that anchor our hearts to thinking rightly about who God is. Look at verse 7. But Yahweh abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will render justice for the peoples with equity. Yahweh also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of distress. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. What a great remedy it is for our soul to to move from praise of God to a contemplation of what God has done, is doing, or will do to a contemplation of God's very attributes. And the first one mentioned here is his eternality. Look at verse 7. Yahweh abides forever. This is a contrast to the enemies who have perished, whose very name has gone away. Listen, the name of Yahweh is not going anywhere. He is eternal. He is unchanging. He abides forever. 
His justice, his standards, his righteousness, his very being are eternal. This is a comfort. It is a stability for a troubled heart. We see in the second half of verse 7 that he is sovereign. He has established his throne for judgment. Throne is a king word establishing God's sovereign regal rule. Even in the realm of judgment. There is no appeal above him. He sits on the throne of judgment. There is no court to which he is accountable. We also learn that God is just. Look at verse 8. He will judge the world in righteousness. Righteousness, his own righteousness, is the standard by which he does judgment. God does not show favoritism. God judges correctly. We're rightly offended when a judge in our world, in our court system, gives favor to his friends, lets the wicked go free, and punishes the innocent. That is a bad judge. God is not a bad judge. He is just. And in verse 8, he says, he will judge the world. The, the normal word for world or land doesn't show up here. This is a, a different word, an unusual word in Hebrew, and a, and a word that, by contrast to the normal words, describes the whole inhabited earth. That's significant here for David, who is feeling local oppression and relational injustices in Israel, a certain location. But here, God is to be just and the just judge over the whole inhabited earth. That is, God will deal with all injustices. All the injustices beyond our perception. All the injustices beyond our own experiences. We feel what we feel that is so close to us. God has a much bigger view. He will deal with all of it. We discover also in verse 8 that He is faithful. He will judge. He will render justice. These are statements about what God will do. It is inevitable. It is inviolable. He will keep his word. He keeps his promises. In verse 9, we also discover that God is compassionate. Yahweh will be a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of distress. Look down at verse 10. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. We learn that God is compassionate. Over and over again in this section, you have the needy, the oppressed, the trusting. Those who are under duress and are lifting their gaze in faith towards Yahweh as a help, as a refuge. He is compassionate. He is kind towards those who look to him for help. And we discover in verse 9 that Yahweh is strong. He is mighty. He will be a stronghold for the oppressed, David sings. A stronghold in times of distress. The word for stronghold here is a word that describes a secure height. A safe place, a safe retreat, a, a high fortress. It is safe and strong out of the reach of trouble. It is a haven, a home. Spurgeon said, He who gives no quarter to the wicked in the day of judgment is the defense and refuge of his saints in the day of trouble. In other words, Spurgeon is saying, when when we face trouble, we have a refuge. We have a place to go. We have a high and secure fortress that is God out and away from trouble. He is there for us. But when the wicked face their day of trouble... They have no refuge. Why? Because their trouble is God himself. The way Spurgeon said it, God will give no quarter to them. He he will not have a home for them. There will not be a safe place. There will be no retreat for the wicked. That is a double comfort for us. Knowing that those who bring about injustices will meet the God of justice. But also knowing that while we are under those injustices, God is ready to meet us as a refuge, as a shelter, as a defense. This present world is as good as the unbeliever will ever have. 
And this present world is the worst that we believers will ever have. (laughs) We also discover in verse 10 that God is attentive and merciful and faithful. For those who know your name, they will put their trust in you. You, Yahweh, do not forsake, or you have not forsaken those who seek you. God is a prayer-hearing God, and he answers, and he does not forsake those who take refuge in him. This is a stunning reality, thinking about taking refuge in a holy God. How can a holy God maintain his reputation and allow us sinners into his presence? We just go back to what we talked about earlier. The answer is the gospel. The only place where justice and mercy can meet is at the cross of Christ, where God can forgive the sins of everyone who will turn to him so that his wrath is assuaged. Listen, the one we must be saved from is God, and the only one who can save us from God is God. And when he saves us from his own justice, he brings us to himself as a refuge. And he is attentive and merciful and faithful, and he will not forsake those who seek and those who put their trust in him. Fourth, in this psalm, we we follow this template for trusting a just God in the midst of the injustices of man. And we are to render praises to God. If this sounds familiar, this is the same as point one. This theme circles back to the beginning. The psalm started with praises. It comes back in the middle to more praises. Look at, look at verse 11. Sing praises to Yahweh who abides in Zion. Back in verse 1, it was, I will give thanks. I will be glad. I will sing praises And now from David's lips is this invitation, this command for everybody sing praises. This is to be a corporate recognition. Everybody sing praises to Yahweh who abides in Zion. He has made Jerusalem. Zion is his word of tender affection for the city of Jerusalem as the capital of his work amongst his people. Yahweh has chosen to abide with his people. What should his people do? Sing praises to him. Declare among the peoples his acts. What was Israel to do? What what was David and the choir director and everybody joining in with this psalm supposed to do? Sing to one another and sing to the world. Yahweh is great and Yahweh is good. Sing his praises. Corporate praise to God ought to be contagious. It ought to excite others to recognize God's greatness. And and you see this in in normal life. You're driving down the highway and cars slow down and you see all the brake lights. What are they slowing down for? Are the lanes blocked? No, the lanes aren't blocked. And if you're on I-10, you realize that someone is off to the shoulder and there's some sort of incident and everybody slows down to gawk. And we're all irritated with one another. So the lanes are open. Just drive. Just keep going. You you can find out about it later if you want to. But if you're in Yellowstone National Park and the brake lights hit and there's a traffic jam, it's because there are bison on the road and you want to see them. You slow down and and you look. This idea that that we all just slow down and, and recognize God's goodness is what this psalm enjoins us to do. Declare among the peoples his acts. This was the design of Israel in the world. God set them apart as his unique people. They were to remain in Jerusalem. They were to live holy, set-apart lives, belonging to Yahweh. The world would look in and say, wow, those people are different. And their lives, their proclamation, their praise would say, we belong to Yahweh and he is ours. Solomon even said that strangers would come, foreigners would come, and they'd see and they'd worship. They'd give glory to Yahweh's name. That was Israel's mission, to be in Zion, to be in Jerusalem, and and to worship God, to sing his praises. There is this evangelistic boast in verse 11, declare among the peoples his acts. 
In verse 12, we see a humbled faith in this praise. The one who requires blood remembers them, that is, the afflicted. The one who requires blood remembers the afflicted. Again, what what a mercy it is to be sinners forgiven, receiving kindness and protection and a refuge in Yahweh. But we must never forget who we were. We, We were on the other side of this equation at one point. To be rescued, to be saved, to be brought into To God's favor is an immense privilege. And even here reminded that Yahweh is one who requires blood. In verse 12, he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. The afflicted are the ones who look up to him who remembers. Verses 13 and 14, the praise continues and, and it turns to a cry for help. Notice David says, be gracious to me, O Yahweh. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death. There is a plea here, a, a cry for help against the injustice. But notice where it turns in verse 14, that I may recount all your praises. That in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. This cry for help turns to praise. It is a cry for help so that there is praise. A desire for God's intervention with the result that God would get the glory for being the God who helps. This is a a remarkable doxological perspective on distress. You're in distress? Think doxology. God, would you be glorified by being my refuge in these difficult times? This is different than the perspective of, I just want to get out of trouble. God, I want the world to know that you are a God who is faithful, who looks upon the needs of the afflicted. Would you be kind to rescue me from this affliction? Be my refuge in the midst of this affliction so that you will be praised. And notice the contrast. He says in verse 13, you lift me up from the gates of death. This sounds like Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 8, doesn't it? We we had the very sentence of death upon ourselves. We we despaired even of life. That's how David feels here. He has been depressed, discouraged, feeling like he's on the precipice of absolute disaster. And the contrast in the next verse is, In the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. That is, in the very gates of this city that is precious to you. The gates were were the important social center, the the front end of the city, sort of the the welcoming place where meetings were held and and people gathered. It is to be welcomed home, to, to go from the very gates of death and the precipice of disaster to be home with God and his people. The fifth Step here in our trusting God in the midst of injustices is to recall the destiny of the unjust. We're back to where we were before. Uh, the verse or point five here is the same as point two. This psalm has taken us back. Look at verse 15. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they've made, in the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. David here is doing another one of these looking back, looking forward episodes. And I think this one, you could probably more easily make the case that this looks forward. This looks forward to the end. It certainly could be true that David had seen the wicked in his own day fall into their own traps. Suffer the consequences of their own wicked schemes. But that will be fully seen In the end, when God judges all the dead. Verse 15 tells us they sink down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. That is, the unjust will not forever live on the fruits of their injustices. There is a day of reckoning coming. And that reckoning will be in proportion to their crimes. It is their own pit which they've made, the the net which they hid. And this is Yahweh's reckoning. Look at verse 16. Yahweh makes himself known. He executes judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. 
You see, God will be known, he will be famous for his holy justice. These statements indicate that the future is sure. That wicked men will not go to a general punishment, but under the justice of God, they will, they will receive a punishment meted out perfectly to fit their sins. The wicked, the unjust, will be accountable for every careless word, Jesus said. For every rebellious thought, for every foul motive, every unjust deed, for every oppression of the weak. Verse 16 ends with two Hebrew words, Higayon Selah. They are untranslated in some of our English texts. Higayon is probably something like according to the lyre, a stringed instrument. And then Selah, we've talked about that. It is that musical interlude, a pause. And I think the idea here is let the instruments play. Don't sing any more words just yet. Let the words that we've just sung reverberate in our hearts. Meditate on them. Think about them as the music swells. Maybe as the music transitions. It is a pause and a rest to contemplate. What are we to contemplate in verse 16? This is a musical interlude designed to have us contemplate the fact that all the deeds of the unjust will return upon their heads. It's hard to think about. If you actually contemplate what it will be like for those who have rejected God's mercy, who have rejected grace, who have rejected the gospel, but have perpetrated deeds worthy of judgment, for them to exit this life, to stand before their maker and judge, accountable for every single thing they've done. For those great books in Revelation 20, the the books of the deeds of the wicked dead to be opened, laid bare before heaven. For the wicked to realize that even the wicked deeds that they themselves forgot about have not been forgotten by the bar of holy justice. They will be accounted for. And that judgment will never end. We can't, we can't pull a, an eternal Selah here to contemplate it. But we pause for a few moments and think, what will it be like for the wicked dead to face God's holy justice for all that they've done? It's too much for the heart to take. I think it's important that we pause and think about that even as a comfort to our own souls when we face injustices, when we try to walk faithfully in this life in a world so dark. To know that God will have his day, I think helps us with perspective and compassion. We'll come back to that in a moment. The wicked are described further in verses 17 and 18. They will return to Sheol, that is the grave. All the nations who forget God. How are they described? They are God forgetters. They don't acknowledge him. They don't think about him. They they reject him. By contrast, verse 18, the needy will not always be forgotten. The hope of the afflicted will not perish forever. God doesn't forget his people. Even though the nations forget God, God remembers his own. That leads us to a final stanza. To help us trust a just God in the midst of the injustices of man. It is to request the vindication of God. Verses 19 and 20. This is a plea. Arise, O Yahweh, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let the nations know they are but men. This is a plea for God's vindication. A plea for God's reputation to go unsullied. And in the end, this is what truly matters. Listen, we are sinners. We deserve every mistreatment that may come our way. 
but the judge of all the earth shall do right. His reputation, his glory, his vindication ought to be our great concern. And so David sings and enjoins us to sing. Rise up, O God. Arise, O Yahweh. That is, show yourself to be God. And by contrast, show the wicked men what they truly are. Don't let them prevail. They are actually puny. They're being propped up for a time. They are pretenders. But those mighty nations, even those oppressive nations that make their war against God and his people, they will be judged. And so the psalmist says, put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let them know they are but men. When God handles justice, watch out. This appeal here that that Yahweh would rise up and, and prevail over sinful, rebellious humanity is a terrifying thing. How does God handle injustices against his infinite nature? He does so in infinite measure. In one of two ways. Either at the cross of his son, Jesus Christ, who in his infinite being as the God man could absorb infinite wrath of a violation of infinite justice for everyone who believes. Or if a sinner is not covered by the blood of Christ, that infinite justice will be invoked forever. There is no other way for it to be satisfied. And so when Paul appeals to Christians in Romans 12, 19, don't take revenge. He says, don't take vengeance, my beloved. That is, if you're loved by God, don't exact vengeance. He says instead, leave room for the wrath. How much room do you have to leave for the infinite wrath of God? Listen, we, this is helpful for us. We, we don't take measures into our own hands with injustices. We entrust ourselves to a faithful creator. A faithful creator who is also a righteous judge, who sits on a throne of righteous judgment, who will deal with the nations and deal with rebellious men in his day, in his way. And you and I could never approximate his way. We don't even understand his proportions. The psalm takes us into the tension of living in this life. Things aren't what they are supposed to be yet. We've seen God do mighty things in the past. We know that he is just and he does what is right now. But the world is not right yet. And there is a day coming when the world will be right. And all will be brought under the lordship of Christ. And all will be brought into conformity with God's righteous standard. That day is coming. And so we wait. Jesus actually taught us to pray very similarly to Psalm 9. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a very similar appeal to rise up, O God, (laughs) set things straight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you particularly for the songbook that leads us in and out of the experiences of humanity in a fallen world where we feel the tensions of the brokenness, the rebellion, the the sin, the oppression, the injustice. We make appeals, we cry out in lament, we lift our eyes in faith. And we pray that we would forever and always give you thanks and praise that you are due. And we do all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.